Nadine Godemer, uh, Nobel Literature Laureate 1991. Uh, welcome to our interview. Thank you. From what origins did Nadine Godemer come to be born in a gold mining town in South Africa? Oh, the usual sort of background for whites in South Africa. Uh, my mother came from England and my father came from Latvia. Is that typical white middle class type of uh, background? No, what I meant was that almost every white person uh, for perhaps a generation, two generations, even three generations before, come, they come from various parts of Europe. And so what mine is not, uh, is not the, the background, it's just one of a number. And what was the sense during your, your youth, during your childhood? Did you get a sense that uh, you were part of an elite that owned South Africa? Oh, it went without saying. If you could call what my background was an elite, it was a small gold mining town. But of course, being white in South Africa, up until uh, the change came, until we got our freedom, to be white was to be automatically belonging to the ruling caste, no matter how humble you were as a white. And did you feel that humility at the beginning or...? Uh, I mean, no, I you, didn't you... feel it at all, because um, it's natural for a child to accept the milieu in which he or she lives. Um, I went to a convent school. Of course, it was also gender-restricted uh, as well. So I went to this convent school, everybody was white, the other girls were white. On Saturdays when you got your pocket money and could go to the movies, it never occurred to me as a child, I think more to any of the others as a small child, that there were no black children there, black children didn't go. The most important thing was that the local municipal library, um, my mother read a lot and she had agreed to us, my sister and me, when we were little, by the time I was six years old, I was inscribed in the children's library. And um, that library, indeed, I still regard as my principal source of education because uh, without that library, I don't think I would ever have been a writer because the only way you can become a writer, the only training is to read. And if I'd been a black kid, I couldn't have used that library. At what point in your childhood did that realisation come that uh, you were part of a privileged elite and that there was an enormous imbalance? Oh, I think it came in, you know, in less formal terms. It came from experience. When I walked to my convent school across the felt, on the left was the, one of the big mines, the Springs Mine, and there was the compound where the black mine workers lived, and they came from all over Africa. And um, I was always warned, now, you know, don't go anywhere near the mine boys. So the, you were instilled with a fear of blackness, even though there was the, the black maid of all work, nanny, whatever, in the house. But of course, she was a woman, she was black, but at least uh, she didn't seem to represent the, uh, the sexual threat that has always existed about um, white attitudes towards black, what they regarded as a threat, as if every black mine worker was waiting to jump on some ugly little 10-year-old schoolgirl. <laughs> but, um, to be serious about it, there were the mine concession stores. The mines would build a row of little stores and they would um, uh, rent them out as a concession to local people who wanted to run them. And the idea was to keep the miners from going into the town. So that I would pass these stores and then I would see how the mine workers, um, many of them still in their semi-tribal dress, blankets and so on, and what have now become dreadlocks, but were just the way they wore their hair, um, coming along and they would want to buy something. Now the counter, there'd be a counter and there would be um, a wire across it, strong wire, kind of fence between the shopkeeper and the customer. And the customer would point at this or that and the owner of the shop would take it down and then the, the black man, he couldn't try anything on, he couldn't touch anything to see whether it was what he wanted. He would have to push his money through and then he would get the, the, the goods. And child as I was, I suppose 11, 12, I couldn't help thinking, this is strange because when I go with my mother into town and I'm buying a pair of shoes or a dress or something, um, we go into a little booth and we try it on. Um, why 
do these black people just have to point something? They can't even look at it and see what it really, what quality it really has. So it was incidents like this that um, made me think about the difference. Also the question of liquor raids. It was, of course, at that time, I'm talking about the 30s now, uh, the late 30s, it was forbidden for blacks to, um, to buy liquor. And so people made their own beer everywhere, all over the place, in the backyards of white houses. And when I was about a little older, I think about 11, then uh, there was a raid one day. I woke up, my parents woke up. We went out into the yard, and there were the policemen, white and black, turning out everything in the, the servants' room, in this old retainer of ours that we'd had since I was two years old, turning her mattress over, pulling her clothes out, looking for beer. And um, my parents stood by, didn't say, where's your warrant to search? You walk into my property. It was simply accepted. And so was the humiliation of, of the woman. And indeed, one of the first adult stories I ever wrote came out of that. Only two, three years later, when at the age of 15, I wrote a story, which indeed um, appeared when I was, in 1939, the year the war broke out, in, um, in a journal, a literary journal in, in, in South Africa. Um, nobody knew that I was a child. But the fact that I'm wanting to point out is that this was such a traumatic thing that I saw with this woman that these two things together that I've described to you began to make me think about the way we lived and why we lived like that and who were we to have uh, the privileges that nobody else had if they were the wrong colour. Do you think that once you began to recognise that injustice, that humiliation, um, you began to sort of piece together a more three-dimensional picture of black South Africans as opposed to the many South Africans who either supported or ignored apartheid who, uh, who never really let black people come into focus as, mm. as real people to them. Yes, but I think you have to look at the circumstances. It was unthinkable for me to meet or know um, black people who would share my interests, with whom, in other words, there could be some sort of natural rapport and meeting. It was always on the the, um, the servant-master basis. And even if you were the child of the master and the mistress, you still had this, this particular position. But being troubled about it and um, beginning, great reader as I always was, beginning to find out that there were, that there was something called racism that existed in the world. And I was living in it. I was part of it. Um, and then when, um, when I was older, and went very briefly to, uh, took the train every day and went to the university. And there for the first time, um, I met, even then there were one or two, there were a few young blacks. Remember the university, of course, was um, whites only. But there were certain, certain courses that were not available in the black universities. And then as a concession at graduate level, postgraduate level, a few blacks would come in. And so I met one or two black people with whom I had far more in common than I had with the young whites that I knew in the, in the town. I was not um, interested, I wasn't sporty, or many of the things that they did were of no, not particular interest to me. And here were young people, black, who were trying to write, who were beginning to write. So we had this enormous, uh, um, not just ambition, we had this enormous way of approach to life and the, the mystery of life and social questions in our own lives. And then I began at that age to make black friends. And then as I myself became a, a young published writer, um, then I'm, and I'm, I moved in, into uh, a different circle, which was, um, again, um, journalists, actors, people who, in the arts, who normally indeed don't follow the, uh, the, the rules, the conservative rules, and where the feeling about the incredible distortions of racism, not only the oppression of blacks, but the distortions in, uh, in your personality, in, in your mind as a white. These became very much part of uh, my life and indeed started um, my way to freedom.
from racism, from racist ideas that I'd been inculcated at school, at home, everywhere since childhood. You, you, you describe yourself as a natural writer. Hmm. If <clears throat> perhaps some of those other people that you met were also natural writers. Yes. What, you know, there was the, the, the recognition of the injustice, there must have been the anger that you felt. What nurtured and fed your, your voice? Well, I suppose that did. And then, of course, it meant that uh, this extended to um, the times when people who um, said what they thought got into trouble. And um, if you were black, the consequences were dire. So that your connections, which had been personal and through the arts, became political. And uh, your friends got into trouble and you found yourself um, having to indeed, uh, when questioned by the police, to tell lies, to say that you hadn't seen them or you didn't know them. Um, apartheid made a fantastic liar out of everybody who was against it. You had to, in order to your friends and others to survive, never mind yourself. So that the two really then developed together. You have a whole generation who grew up under apartheid, whose children are now getting a different kind of education. Um, is there a sort of a generation gap which doesn't offer the type of support that is necessary to nurture young writers.